Okay, so we're now recording. So for the recording, let me just say my name is Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning librarian. And here today we'll be talking with experienced instructors from UNCG who have years of experience teaching online in both undergraduate and graduate level. So we have Katherine Aldridge from Human Development and Family Studies. We have Pam Brown from Kinesiology, specifically Kinesiology EDD. And we have Carrie Rosario from Public Health Education. So I'm going to mute myself and y'all can start with just kind of a brief introduction of your experience with teaching online at UNCG and then we'll start taking questions from the audience and from the Google form. Um, and I'm going to put the Google form in chat one more time. Um, if y'all want to use that or again, you're welcome to put your questions in chat since we don't have a huge audience today. Thanks. Okay, I guess I'll just start. I'm Pam Brown, as uh, Sam said, the director of the educational or the doctor of education in kinesiology and that online program. This is our sixth year. So that's a big part of my online experience. And prior to that, um, I had been part of the group that did iSchool. So the university, uh, I guess, since I don't know, in the early 2000s started offering some courses through UNCG online and was part of that. So I've been teaching online in some fashion at UNCG since 2005, maybe even a little bit earlier than that, both for the undergrad and graduate. Um, I'm Katherine Aldridge with Human Development and Family Studies, um, also in, in the School of HHS. And um, I direct one of the online degree completion programs in the undergrad. Uh, it's an undergrad program. We also have a graduate program, but I'm over all the undergrad program. Um, and I've been teaching online for quite some time and was um, I actually was one of the people who did the feature that you may have seen, um, learning to teach. And um, so I, uh, I actually teach in several different modalities. So I've experienced teaching asynchronously, synchronously, face-to-face, -face, which doesn't help us right now. Um, and um, in our newest modality, which is a blended program, blend it with a classroom, it meets half in a video conference room with main campus students and half online. So I sort of have experience in, um, in those areas, if you have questions in those areas. Hi, I'm Carrie Rosario. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Public Health Education. And I began my time at UNCG as uh, associate director of the undergraduate program in our department, one of which has an online program, Health Studies Online. Um, and I served in that capacity for um, several years and have continued to um, help our online programs, our online students, and currently teach in our online health studies program in the department. I also have um, some experience prior to UNCG with online learning um, and I have uh, had the pleasure of being an online learner, both synchronously and asynchronously, which really helps to inform my teaching and um, directs my desire for engaged and innovative online learning. So hopefully that will contribute to the discussion today. Okay, so we have, um one question into the Google form right now, and I just dropped it in the chat. I might have dropped the other Google form in there by accident before, so sorry, but you can also just put them in the chat. But a question we got on the Google form is, what strategies, techniques do you use to engage students and encourage interaction and discussion? For example, in breakout rooms or discussion boards on Canvas? Well, I can get us started. Um, I, I do several different things around this and uh, one is discussion boards, you know, where we read certain material and then I pose certain questions where they post and then respond to each other. Um, I also have assignments where they do peer review because the students in my program graduate to be teachers. It's a licensure 
issuing program. Not easy to say. Um, um, one of the things I have done more of recently is access the Arc Studio feature in Canvas because I think one of the points of this is keeping them engaged with each other and feeling a part of the campus and a part of the program and that type of thing. And so I have had more um, assignments where they either posted or responded to each other using the video audio capability of Arc Studio, which is embedded in our campus uh, course shelves. And uh, one of the things I used that for was a book club. So I had several books in the field. They signed up for the book of interest. And so they were in with students who shared interest with them. And they would have book club and use Arc Studio to talk back and forth and that type of thing. So there's just a few suggestions of ways to, um, to to keep them kind of held close and engaged with me and with others in the class. Thank you. I will um, echo uh, Catherine's comments there. I have used Arc Studio for my classes and it, it really has contributed to an engaged learning environment for discussions. In fact, at graduation, many of the students who are again, not on campus where they have the opportunity to see each other, have commented about knowing who they're in the classroom with because they can see and hear um, their, their, their peers and their colleagues in the classroom. I that, that using group leaders or discussion groups where there's Hey, um, Kara, I think you froze a little bit, but um, while we're waiting for Carrie, um, Pam, do you want to say anything about this? Yeah, we um, sometimes actually even use some of the Google tools. So before having Zoom and everything else, our students do a lot of work with the Google suite. So we've used Google Hangout. We sometimes assign them in that way. But we've also used things like Google Slides. So when you think of the discussion board in Canvas, you know, and that's not a, a speaking space. So we've also used Google Slides and had them do different things where they've included pictures or other kinds of video and things along that line to help them interact and engage and with our program being totally online before we have them come to campus for an orientation we actually have them do a new student um, series like a slide series and so they put a photo information about themselves we ask them to do a short video it also forces them to practice tech in advance of when they really need to use it and that's something that a lot of times they'll go back and you know, kind of talk about that being a great way to get started to know each other. And again, I've done that with undergrads for different assignments that lent themselves well to um, maybe, you know, again, photos or other things that were appropriate. And sometimes you just have to give a little more guidance about what to include and definitely monitor it, but it gave them some other talking points besides just seeing text about themselves and others. Okay, so I think um, Carrie might have gotten cut off, so she's probably trying to get in, back in. So um, Matt asked, and I um, wrote him back to ask him what department he uh, they are with, but um, they were asking about a uh, using a .dot .csv file to set up breakout sessions in advance of a class session. So I mean, I don't really know a whole lot about that. If you don't know about that, that's fine. But have any of y'all used breakout sessions within Zoom or WebEx? And um, what do y'all think about that in terms of synchronous? Uh, I, yes, the answer is yes. They're very, um, so far as I'm concerned, they're very helpful. And um, I most often just let the um, technology randomly sort the students. I only do that if there's a specific targeted um, assignment, but um, I like putting them in breakout rooms. I like being able to move from one to the other and hear what they're saying and answer their questions and that kind of thing. I have not used 
the one you just said right there, but I do use it on WebEx and on Zoom. I think it does, I think it helps them bond a little bit more, but the other thing it does is if I let it ran, just randomly assign, is they get to know somebody different each time, and I, th I find that to be helpful. I just, before this, got off a session where the students self-selected, and in that case, we ended up with a group of students that had done lots of talking before they got to the meeting, just on their own. So there were many things we had to ask them to get them to speak about versus it being a more natural conversation. So um, most of the time we do the random assignment, like Catherine was saying, it seems to provide um, I don't know, it just seems to allow for, for more conversation, but I, there definitely are times where we're having it preset or having it, um, you know, makes a difference. But a lot of times I just do the random assignment as well. And again, pre, just before this, so a why we sometimes really do that because it was an odd conversation. And I see that Carrie is back. Hey. Hey, sorry, I don't Carrie. know what happened. And uh, we're, we're just talking about, um, teaching uh, using breakout rooms. So Pam and Catherine were talking about that. If you have any experience using breakout rooms in either WebEx or Zoom. Um, and then I'll, I'll ask the following up questions as well after that. I, I don't have any recent experience with the breakout rooms in, um, in Zoom, um, but uh, I have used them in the past. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, challenging to monitor um, but I think there are ways to use them effectively if there are, there's enough guidance um, provided in you know before they're assigned or before they um, they break out particularly how to come back to the full group if that's a requirement okay so um Crystal then asks, what innovative strategies for online engagement for asynchronous courses have you received the most positive feedback from students? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, what innovative strategies for online engagement for asynchronous courses have you received the most positive feedback from students? Uh, I, I, for me, circling back around, I got a lot of positive feedback on something that Pam mentioned, and then again on these recordings. Um, I had them do a little um, slideshow on themselves and I did give them some parameters just wanted to let you know that you um, I I did give them for you know not permission really because these are adults but I did tell them after they did the following things that I felt like they needed to know about each other that they could choose some things of interest <clears throat> keeping it between keeping it between the ditches here and um, they really liked that and they found commonalities um, in people that they didn't know they shared. And so, um, you know, got a lot of good feedback about that. But then the other thing is that moving to Arc Studio for some of the um, responses on book club and discussion boards. And, you know, here again, my students are going to be little teachers when teachers of little people when they graduate. So I also created some virtual classrooms and created a virtual classroom uh, scenario where they had to put themselves in as the teacher and do this type of thing and back up what strategies they were going to use uh, with research and there was a you know recorded portion of that as well and they really liked that getting to go ahead and pretend like they're teachers and stuff like that they were you know they've actually asked for more assignments to use uh, <clears throat> Arc Studio win, and I'm like, you bet. So those those are my things. I think they like being able to see each other. I would agree with that. Um, I've received a lot of positive feedback from uh, the students at the end of the term <laughs> um, that 
you know, in a course that I've used Arc Studio, they really have enjoyed being able to actually see and um, engage with their peers in a different way. Um, and it's taught me to make sure that I provide them with sufficient instructions for how to engage with Arc Studio in advance so that the um, tech concerns that they may have um, don't erase the benefits that they see at the end of the class. Um, but they've really enjoyed that. I would also say, similar to Catherine, um, I teach a, a, a course that is the capstone for our students in the health studies program. And it's a case-based capstone that's almost entirely discussion, um, where they're engaged in discussions as teams, and then we come to a full class discussion. And that is all done asynchronously, which is a bit challenging given the model was uh, designed for face-to-face -face classrooms. However, um, students really appreciate being put in those situations, I think, as you mentioned, Catherine, and being asked to um, respond to a series of prompts not delivered to them all at once, but um, the prompts that sort of emerge across the discussion so that they can use what they've learned and um, engage in, in the discussion with their peers in a way that sort of mimics real life as best um, as you can do it in an online setting. And I have not used the ARC Studio, but we still have, you know, done some similar things because our program is asynchronous. Up until more recently, we really weren't doing very many live or synchronous meetings. Um, our students are all different time zones, kinds of things like that. So we try to, you know, keep our model as flexible as possible. But with recent times, we have added some optional meetings and, you know, allowed a certain number of students to join if they wanted to. And that's been really nice because the students have appreciated the opportunity you know, to, to join because they wanted or needed to see people versus right now where everybody's trying to be on Zoom 24-7 or, you know, find other synchronous models. So for us, that's been a plus. But going along with what Carrie was saying about the case study model, that's probably been uh, there. We do have one course that's set up that way. It's almost a choose your own adventure in a, in a sense for some parts of it because how people respond will impact the next decision and will also impact the discussion. But with that course, there's this case study that they're moving through. Um, there are discussions, but then we also utilize, again, the Google Suite. So there's some work that they're doing in Google Docs in groups, and those groups do change. And that's kind of how they're, um, you know, where they're, where, do, where, the, where they're doing their talking. So it's more through the commenting features in that space than it is the actual discussion in the Canvas suite. So that those are things that they've found very positive. And again, times that they can see and hear one another that don't have to be live time. So there are times where we're asking them for recorded either audio or video feedback, and not every time, but a couple of times with it being in that fashion, and they seem to appreciate that as well. So it's not everything is always, you know, they're not always reading text but they're hearing from each other. Great. So Matt asks, um, there are quite a number of apps that can be integrated with Canvas. It's a lot to sort through. Um, how, I would say, do you figure out which tools are especially helpful for teaching online? And I guess, you know, um, we've talked about Canvas Studio, Google Apps, um, other things, uh, but are there other things or too, as well as that in terms of selecting apps online, or how do you think about it in terms of integrating with Canvas? Um, well, I think about the learning objectives, right? What is it that I want them to accomplish and what are some ways that they might be able to do that? And I also have a diverse array of students and they have different experiences, um, both with technology and also life experiences. So I try to think about um, apps that will um, reduce the reading, um, allow them to experience things, and also help me to meet the learning um, outcomes or learning objectives that I might have for a particular um, module or a particular course. And I use H5P. Um, I know that 
that's something that's become more familiar around the university, but um, it has a, a lot of, um, of options, right? Sometimes it might feel like so many options where you wanna try them all, but it really does allow you to pick um, ways that your students can engage with content that will help you meet the particular learning um, objective that you, um, that you want them to meet. And um, there's, you know, uh, drag and drop features, there's, you know, quizzing, there's, um, if they're watching a video and there's certain themes that you want them to take away from, they have questions where there's fill in the blanks. It's, it's not always something that you have to grade um, it, it grades itself or it helps the students sort of self check, which again allows them to not necessarily engage with each other per se, but it allows them to engage with the content, which is really important, I think, um, rather than just relying on, did you read this? And then, you know, let me quiz you later. It allows an opportunity for them to sort of self quiz throughout. I think Carrie's, um, you know, about the self check or the the opportunities to engage in ways that don't burden the instructor, but still provide the students with touch points and ways to see that they're understanding the material, applying the material correctly is really important. So it doesn't, um, you can't grade everything, you know, and, and it's not even necessary. So looking for ways that they can engage with the material that is meaningful to them um, is important. So again, the HP5 is, is a great tool. And then I think there's other ways to do it too. On this panel, I am the speaker who is um, less apt to give you valuable information for your question. And I apologize for that. So let me go ahead and own it. Um, <clears throat> like Carrie, my um, students vary widely. Um, you know, I have some 19, 20 year olds, very few, um, cause they've been to community college, but one of my students is 70 and she's already got a kindergarten classroom lined up for fall if the children go back to school. Um, so I tend to, and I, and I also teach all the way from a foundational, we just hit UNCG course all the way through the capstone. And what I tend to do is as I get to know my students in each of those widely varied types of courses, um, is as I get to know them, I might pick and choose something that is applicable to them that supports their learning, but I'm fairly careful with it because I have such a wide uh, variety of um, tech users. And just to let you know, my 70 year old is one of the best. <laughs> Didn't see that coming and she's fabulous. Um, so that, that was my bad. But um, what I will say is that I, have learned with this variety to follow the model that uh, a different ITC, Pam Brown, Pam, um, how, how, uh, yes, sorry, thank you, um, gave me which is to kiss it with my students. So I'll try to keep it very simple. And sometimes this means not adding additional technology um, beyond what I have given them. So um, that may not be sage advice, but it's, it's what I've got. <laughs> And I also think it's sometimes okay to just have those conversations with your students. What things are they using outside of the classroom in, for other classes? What would be helpful? And then that's a good way to, to kind of guide some of the what next and where you put your efforts. Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, Chris, oh, sorry, Carrie, do you want to say something else? No, I was just going to say really, I mean, the the course is for the students. So I think um, in a lot of ways, you know, you need to communicate um, with them, whether it's throughout the course or at least at, at a minimum at the end of the course to provide feedback for ways in which you can um, engage them better or differently um, the next round. But students drive a lot of it because they're the ones doing the learning. So Crystal asked, are there any recommended online polling sites that you can recommend for Canvas? I'm going to get a link and put it in the chat box. Um, 
So I have been very simple with my polling um, and it's not, you know, I, I teach asynchronous courses, so um, it's less important for me to have that immediate feedback on the polling. Um, but I, I usually am just pretty simple with what students are familiar with and that's Google Forms um, because I can in, engage with it simply. I can embed it in Canvas. I can just drop a link um, and students can access it on their various devices pretty easily. Um, so that's usually what I do, especially if um, I need to get all the feedback and chew it out in a very simple, um, simple way. And sometimes we'll even skip the Google Forms and just create a Google Sheet and have the students reply directly in that space. Um, you know, if it's something that is okay for people to be sharing in that way, but sometimes it's just a chance to check and then everybody can even see it as it's progressing. Um, oh, I, um, Zoom has a very, um, very simple polling system that you can set up in, in advance, but WebEx, on the other hand, doesn't. And so direct, um, directpoll.com is um, a, a good one to use if you're on, if you're on WebEx and, um, they, and they can answer one question at a time. And you can do kind of what both of them alluded to earlier. You can then take it, you know, you can sort of follow where your students are taking you with, you know, what comes next and that kind of thing. Have some general idea set up and then based on how they respond and getting the percentages and of, you know, where you're going and, and tailor it to um, the, the uh, direction. So kind of observing their interest as it goes along. And, and, and I also liked Carrie bringing in that all of this is linked to our learning objectives. Uh, so that's certainly true as well, even with this. So I hope that link helps. Okay, so another question that came up on the um, form is, uh, do you have suggestions for um, how we can make help students feel comfortable with remote learning and technology if they haven't had previous experience in remote learning? That's back to Pam saying ask the student. Um, I actually, um, I do Google Meet, live Google Meet with them because it just shows up in their inbox and they don't have to figure anything out except clicking on my invitation. And um, then once I have them in front of me, then I can use whatever screen share or present or whatever I need to do um, to help them. And I've got them right there where I can see their face and I can read their body language and tell how I'm doing. And so I, you know, I actually use one technology to try to solve um, success with other technologies that I'm going to use. So that's, that's what I'm doing right now. I, and I need, I need to point out the caveat that most of my courses and most of the students I was teaching were already savvy online learners. But I do have those blended courses where I had the main campus students sitting in front of me until the coronavirus and uh, their learning curve was way steeper and like this. And so that was, that was what I did. And Carla um, Wilson, uh, the School of Education ITC, uh, put a link to readytolearn.uncg.edu in there if you haven't seen that. It's a resource for students uh, transitioning online learning uh, that was made right before we all went home. Uh, so that is in the chat as well, readytolearn.uncg.edu. I would say for all of my courses, um, I think about what I'm going to ask of students in advance and the technology that I might use in my class and then Basically, that first week of classes, not everyone can do this, but the first week of courses, uh, classes, excuse me, instead of diving into everything um, in terms of content, I might ease into content, uh, basically because students may drop, right, and that affects my group formation. But during that week, I really use it as an orientation period to my 
um, my class, my expectations. So if we're going to use discussion boards, this is how we might use them and then give them a chance to practice with um, a discussion exercise in the way in which we might use it for the course. Um, if I'm going to use Google Forms or H5P or whatever else, you know, in terms of technology, um, we might expose them to that's the time for them to get a feel for it and to learn what questions they might have so that I can troubleshoot before it's going to affect um, an assignment or you know a discussion where they actually need to engage um, with their peers um, so that's how I approach it and I you know agree with Carrie as far as trying to make that part of the learning process and oftentimes especially with undergrads because you almost always have to tie points to something I'll put in a low stakes assignment so it may only be worth a point or a few and it's something that they're going to really need later so if they do it now and they get the zero because they didn't do it or they didn't follow through and ask for help on how to do it better um, it's not going to crush them but it allows you as the instructor to then follow back up with them, you know, and really help. Or if you see that everybody missed it, did they miss it because they were afraid to do it? Did they miss it because the technology didn't work? You know, it allows you some opportunity to, to hopefully um, troubleshoot, you know, and, and improve that. Um, you know, if you have time in advance, if it's ahead of time, then you can do things to share out with the students some of the tools you might be using, but I know that's not where we're at right now. So a lot of it would be um, speaking to them, asking them what they're comfortable with, trying to keep it simple for you and them. Um, you know, and again, some low stake things that they can practice with before it becomes their final project. And these two ladies' wisdom have made me think about something else that I do that I've forgotten. Um, and that is that I offer practice sessions. And, I, and they aren't mandatory. They're not penalized in any way if they don't come. And because most of my students, um, well, not right now, but normally are in the school system or Head Start or somewhere as assistant teachers earning their degree to be lead teachers. I have these in the evening. I have them on Saturday morning. I have them at a time they can come if they choose to come. And um, also just as a aside to this is that even if you're teaching an asynchronous course, it doesn't mean that you can't offer a synchronous um, opportunity. Last spring, I taught a family diversity course, and there are a lot of really hard topics to discuss and really hard issues to, to thrash out in a family diversity course. And so um, every few weeks in the evening after work, you know, like at six or seven, I offered um, a synchronous session if somebody needed to help think through, you know, a topic we were discussing or, you know, had a reality about their own life or something like that. And those were actually pretty well attended. Um, I hadn't done that before in other courses, but I found the students in, in this particular course um, to, be, to be struggling internally with some of the things that they were facing and learning and I just want to point out that even if a course is asynchronous you can have a synchronous portion of it um, I don't think it's fair to make it you know point worthy or anything like that because not everybody has that capability or that open time but I just wanted to throw the thought out there and then they get to meet and talk with you and, and each other as well if you have that opportunity. Sometimes I'll also ask if there are students that seem to be successful with the technology or the assignments, if they might be willing to, you know, be a go-to person, or maybe they have the session, you know, like, a, okay, on Friday from this time to this time, I'm happy to answer some questions, but sometimes that'll help relieve you as the faculty member, and they might ask a peer questions that they may not feel as comfortable asking you initially. Okay, sorry. This is my two year old. <laughs> okay, wait a second, buddy. Um, so uh, it's, it's a webinar. Um, so uh, I want to give people uh, time for other questions if they had them. Um, who had to step out, who was in this meeting, 
uh, wanted to point out that the School of Health and Human Sciences are leaders in online instruction, and it is clear that the instructors in the panel are devoted to engaging students using uh, these techniques. So uh, he said he really appreciated uh, to the seminar, uh, coming to the seminar. So thank you all for coming. I am biased because uh, I work with Catherine, Carrie, and um, Pam a lot. I am lucky, but y'all are truly great, and I'm so happy you could share our knowledge. If you're still um, here, I have a quick survey. Uh, if you wanted to give us your feedback about this, the only other panel that we might have planned for this series, because I know everyone's really busy with final grading, is we're trying to work on one for next week about academic integrity in online learning, um, particularly looking at like Respondus Lockdown Browser and just coming up with solutions for um, us having to deal with academic integrity online. Uh, so stay tuned, I'll send out emails. We're still ironing out the panelists and the date, but it will be sometime next week. Um, but thank you all for coming. If there are no final questions or comments, my two-year-old is starting to play with the vacuum in front of me. Um, we can start wrapping this up, but is there anything else before I end this meeting? Thank you, I enjoyed it. And in early childhood, I like it when a child is exploring. Oh, good, yeah, I'll have it. Here, May, you wanna say hey to everyone before we leave? Hello. Hey. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> so, there you go. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. She definitely is exploring. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> so thank you all for coming and thank you, Sam. Have a great thank weekend. You. It's Friday. Hey. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye, thank you. Good weekend. Bye. Bye everyone. Good to be with you two again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Sam. Bye. Bye. Thank you Bye. all.